Welcome to the latest in a series of development and support webinars delivered by the NIHR Academy. My name is Sarah Howarth and I work in the NIHR Academy as the development and support manager. This webinar, Effective Delegation in a Digital Age, is delivered in collaboration between the NIHR Academy and Capfinity, our leadership development program partners. This webinar will be facilitated by Step Hopper from Capfinity, and I'm going to hand over to her now. Thank you so much, Sarah. Delighted to be here today. Um, the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is just grab a piece of paper, actually, um, a piece of paper and a pen for an exercise we're going to do in a few minutes time. So my name is Stephanie Hopper. I am one of the directors of the talent practice at Capfinity. Um, I am an executive coach and facilitator, and I've worked in a variety of leadership roles in various organisations. I've got a master's in applied positive psychology, and um, I've been one of the lead facilitators for the Future Focused Leadership Programme with the NIHR over the past three years, which has been, I have to say, a great privilege. As we become more senior and take on leadership roles, to free up time for more strategic work becomes more and more important. We need to find a way to begin to deliver through others rather than do everything ourselves. And that involves, involves effective delegation, which is much more than just explaining to someone how to do a task. So in this webinar, we're going to be exploring how to choose the most effective delegation approach given the task so that the other person feels really motivated and engaged and supported and up for the challenge, whether we're doing that virtually or in person. Let's first of all um, dive into a reflection question. So how comfortable are you when it comes to delegating work? And what I'm sharing with you on the screen is a spectrum. At one end of the spectrum is I struggle to let go, where we might find ourselves thinking things like, oh, it's much quicker to do it myself. I'll, uh, if I had a pound for everybody on this uh, call who probably would say yes to that, I think I would do well. I'd have at least 50 quid. Um, I don't trust them or I feel the task is my responsibility. At the other end of the spectrum, we've got, you know, I'm happy to delegate and relinquish control. Where maybe we'd be thinking things like, it might be quicker if I do it this time, but it won't always be. And I can't do everything. If I delegate, others will learn. So what I'd like you to do is just reflect honestly for a moment. Typically, how much do we spend thinking more towards the struggle to let go versus the happy to delegate and relinquish control? We'll shortly launch a poll to gauge people's feelings about this. The answers will come up anonymously, so there's no right or wrong answer. It's really just a reflection point for us. So here's um, uh, the poll. So thinking about the last month, is your mindset ratio between struggle to let go, which is the first point, or happy to delegate? Typically, 100% of the time, are you struggling to let go? Or is it 80% of the time? Or I can see my first brave person voted on 50-50. Where do you sit, would you say, in terms of um, your mindset when it comes to delegation? I'll just give you one more minute to, uh, to vote. It looks to me like most of us are in the struggling to let go camp more of the time, which is probably what I expected because that's probably why we're all on this call, hey? Um, yeah, so we've got, um, I'm going to end the poll now. Here are the results. So um, one person, well, very honestly, two people actually said, 100% of the time, I'm struggling to let go. Thank you for your honesty. Quite a lot of us at the 80-20 and a lot of us at the 60-40. Um, so interesting, actually, isn't it? This this kind of wanting to hang on to stuff um, rather than finding it easy to let go of them. There are six inspirational characters towards the bottom here who um, are saying 80 percent of the time they're happy to delegate and 20 percent of the time struggle to let go. And obviously there's a lot of context that goes around this. I'm just going to close the poll for a moment um, because 
If we work with a very experienced team who've been doing their jobs for some time, it potentially is easier probably to delegate. But if we've got new team members or people who are inexperienced at some of the tasks that they're being asked to conduct, there may be justification in finding it hard to let go. I know that a few years ago I was asked to do some finance reporting and it was something I found really hard to let go of. I had, I was struggling with it, to be honest, and a lot of my team kept saying to me, oh, Steph, I love a spreadsheet, you know, give me the spreadsheet, I'll have a go. But actually, as I didn't really understand it entirely, and I felt I was accountable, I wasn't in a position to let that go. And some of my reluctance was feeling I needed to get my heads around these, this reporting and really understand it and know what I needed before I could get help with it. And so in some ways I felt I was justified despite the late nights looking at spreadsheets, trying to fiddle these numbers so that they looked the way they needed to look and they were giving the, the data that we, we needed to analyze. And I guess if you reflect on that ratio, um, it might have shifted over the last couple of years when many of us will have probably been delegating a lot more remotely than we ever were before. When it's much harder to see how our delegation has landed with the person that we're giving the work to. Um, we may have that initial conversation, but we're not sat next to them seeing how they're getting on with that work. And it really becomes imperative that there are those check ins afterwards to know how they're coping with it. A lot of teams we've worked with um, in recent years have found the ratio has shifted far more to struggling to let go and figure out how to delegate in the digital world. So you're not alone if you were struggling there. The good news is, though, that in 2021, Dr. Soga, who is a lecturer in entrepreneurship and leadership at Henley Business School, found, and I'll just read the quote on the slide to you, that managers of remote teams who improve their delegation skills can address virtual distance, the biggest impediment to their success, by leveraging delegation as a tool to close the gap. So specifically, they found in this research that gaps and divergence in purpose, which can make the difference between good and great teams, can be significantly narrowed by skillful delegation. So actually, it's a tool that if we master it can really help when we're not in person with people all the time. One example that the researchers gave is when a manager delegates what is deemed a kind of make or break task, such as maybe engaging with powerful stakeholders, that can significantly reduce kind of affinity distance for an employee who feels really trusted for having been given that opportunity. So effective delegation, whether remote or in person, is about changing your mindset and adopting new habits. Thank you to those of you posting questions in the Q&A. We're going to save all of those for the end, but do keep them coming and feel free to vote on them, as we mentioned at the beginning. So let's have a look at the mindsets that sometimes or often apply when we're stuck on the I'm struggling to let go end of the spectrum. And then look at some of the thoughts for different perspectives. So the first one is, I can do it better or quicker. Um, again, I suspect that might be one a lot of us have felt. And I think one of the problems is often we get promoted, particularly when it's our first managerial job. And the reason we've been promoted is because of our knowledge and our experience. So actually, quite often, this may be true. But this is a big limiting blocker, because if we always do it, we're not going to be freed up to do those more strategic activities. And we're also not going to grow and coach the people who work underneath us. So a different perspective might be, I can't do everything. If I delegate, they're going to learn. Secondly, I want it done my way. Again, I think this comes from quite often the situation. You know, we may have conducted this work ourselves in the past. We've done it in a particular way for many years. Um, and we know our way has succeeded. In fact, we've got the evidence. We've been promoted to tell us that actually we have done it the right way. But actually a different perspective might be that the other person might have some suggestions about a different way, maybe an even better way. And, you know, we don't have to hand over the entire how they conduct the task. And we'll look at that later. 
it might be that we can discuss the approach they're going to take. So there's a bit of your way of doing things and a bit of their way of doing things as well. Thirdly, it went wrong last time. And I experienced this recently. Um, and it's really anxiety provoking, I think, when something has not gone the way we hoped. And it takes all the more courage, I think, as a leader to enable someone to try again. And But actually, if we don't give them the, those opportunities to try again, they will never learn. So using that experience to increase the chances of that not happening again is a different way of looking at that and really thinking about how you as a leader and a coach can support them in preventing what went wrong the previous time. I don't trust them. I mean, this is a tricky one, isn't it? Especially with new starters, because we don't have that established relationship. So I think starting by delegating small and um, handing over the responsibility uh, gradually is a good way of doing that, it can give us some reassurance and them as well. I feel the task is my responsibility. I mean, it's a bit like my blocker I shared already about the finance reports. And um, I guess handing over the task isn't the same as handing over the responsibility. In my case, I couldn't hand over the task because I didn't completely understand it at first. But once I did, I was able to involve two or three project managers in helping me. And then that made all the difference. I feel uncomfortable dumping more work on them. So, you know, another way of thinking about this, and this is hard, isn't it? Because when people are busy and stretched, and especially if you're working virtually with them, you might not always see this immediately. So when you arrange to speak to them, you become aware that they've got a lot on and actually you feel uncomfortable about, um, you know, asking them to do more. I guess here it's thinking about, is this an opportunity for them perhaps to explore something they'd really like to do? What I love is how often when I get a team member involved in something that uses their strengths, you see them lean into the task and suddenly that to-do list doesn't seem such a problem for them. I'm not suggesting that's always the case, but I think if we can align people to tasks they find energizing and that they're good at doing, it's amazing how easily they can absorb those. But also I think there's an element of helping them reprioritize their work as well. Um, and, and they're under the different perspective, also suggesting that just because I don't want to do this task doesn't mean they'll feel the same way. Some people relish those. And in fact, I often think that as we develop and mature as managers and leaders, we get better and better at hiring people who are better at doing things than we are. And actually, that is the secret to success a lot of the time, is that actually they have some domain specific knowledge that maybe we don't have or a passion for something that we don't have. And all those sort of some of those parts can create great managers and great leaders. I guess another thing to remember is the tendency we have as humans to self enhancement bias. And we often think we're better than others at things. And that can be the cause of us being kind of reluctant to delegate. And the classic example everyone uses is with driving. So if you ask someone to rate their driving skills on a one to 10 scale, there's a good chance they'll give themselves an above average rating, like a seven out of 10. Have a think, what would you say your driving uh, skill ability is? I bet most of us are over a five, but obviously we can't all be above average drivers. So, um, or maybe we're just worried that everyone else will be better than us. Um, but with delegation, we often think our situation is unique. Um, and as I'm explaining this to you, I'm thinking, mm, maybe that was me with those finance reports. Um, but it's kind of too difficult in our situation to delegate. You know, it needs our unique skill set on it. So this session is going to give you some tools to delegate in an effective way, whatever the situation. But as we've just explored, I guess the first step is to get into the right mindset. And the bottom line is to grow as managers and leaders and become more strategic, we need to deliver through others and give them the space and opportunity to grow themselves. And having worked with lots of leaders through the Future Focus Leadership Programme who are funded by the NIHR, I know this is something that lots of you will identify with. At whatever level you're at in your leadership journey, there's always this need to create the space for the thinking, for the longer term work, for the 
the important non-urgent work that we kind of never get to because there's all this reactive stuff going on. So if we don't learn how to delegate effectively, it can really impact our ability to lead. So we've got no choice, I would say, about delegating more. And what we need to focus on is how we do it effectively, especially in this more sort of digital virtual world where we've got less social cues um, available to indicate whether the other person has understood what the task is and how engaged they feel as well. And the challenge with delegation is often there is in the short term, um, things are going to maybe be a bit painful. It's not always easy straight away, but we can need to keep kind of reminding ourselves that there will be long term benefits, both for the other people and for us. And it was beautifully summarized by one of our emerging research leaders who attended the Future Focus Leadership Program. And they kind of captured the benefits really well in this quote. I've implemented coaching and delegation strategies and reduced my level of micromanagement quite considerably, which has led to increased self-reliance and productivity by team members. I think we'd all like a bit of that, wouldn't we? And this is backed up by wider research by Yoon and colleagues with registered nurses in long-term care hospitals, which found that effective delegation improves satisfaction, responsibility, productivity, and development. And I'll give you the link to that at the end of the session today. So we spent a bit of time on the benefits and we've got those kind of clear in our mind, hopefully. We've seen how the blockers can impact us. What we're gonna do for the rest of today's session is look at some practical approaches to deciding the how, the what and the who of effective delegation in a digital age. So this is the moment where you need um, a piece of paper and a pen. So I'll just pause to make sure you can grab or a pencil, piece of paper and a pen. Great, okay. So what I would love you to do is I would like you to build a house. I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to build that house. Um, I am just gonna set my timer for 30 seconds. And um, I would like you to, bear with me, there we go. Okay. Um, I would like you to, yeah, build your house, entirely up to you what it looks like. Off you go, 30 seconds. Fifteen seconds left. OK, five, four, three, two, one. OK, put your pencils down. So um, I don't know, your houses may look like one of these or may look quite different. I suspect we've got a range of houses, depending how creative we were feeling today something we probably all did when we were at school originally. I'm gonna ask you to do this again now, and we're gonna draw a second house. Again, I'm gonna give you 30 seconds. This time, that house should have two windows, one on either side of the front door. It needs a chimney and it needs a sloping roof. Off you go, 30 seconds. So 10 seconds left to draw that house, two windows, slopey roof, chimney, five, four, three, two, one. Brilliant. It's like a take up, take heart. Anyway, um, okay. So this time round, I'm wondering actually if your house looked a bit like this. I suspect it might have done. And what I'd love you to reflect on, and I'll just put it in the um, in the chat now, is a few questions to think about that. So first of all, what were the differences in the two parts of the instructions that I gave you? In which part did you feel more engaged? 
And what was the impact of both of these delegations being given virtually? There's no specific right or wrong way. I just wanted to demonstrate to you the two different styles that we can use and approaches that really provide different outputs when we begin delegating. And they're typically known as precise task focus delegation and at the other end of the spectrum, relational delegation. So it's a continuum between these two. Precision task delegation is where we explain exactly what we want someone to do and give quite specific instructions. Relational delegation, the focus is more on the other person's strengths and aspirations, um, with us, us explaining, I guess, what needs to be achieved, but leaving them to decide how. This is a really useful analogy. And, you know, when you walk away from this session today, I hope you could hold this picture in your head because for me, it works really well. But given the person and the task, do you need to be the sat nav giving very precise instructions or do you need to be the torch that perhaps highlights the end point and maybe some of the challenges along the way, but allows others to figure out their path? Or are you something in between or do you need to be something in between? And I do think this is defined by the person and the task. So it's not something that is um, universal across all delegation. If you're anything like me, um, I love a sat nav. It makes life so much less stressful. I am old enough to remember getting the A to Z out after I passed my driving test, mapping out routes. I live in London, across London, um, and spending a lot of time getting lost. Uh, not always owning up to the fact I got lost. So the fact that we put in our postcode and it takes me exactly where I need to go to with limited stress um, is brilliant. However, what I noticed about that is I rarely learn those routes. And when I was reliant on an A to Z and my intuition, um, I actually know that I learned those routes much better. So the sat nav is great. We arrive where we need to, but potentially no learning has taken place. And that's when we need to think about what we are behaving, like how we are behaving as the delegator. So let's look a bit more closely at the two types of delegation. So the first one, precise task focused delegation. It's definitely got its place. It's, um, it's short term. So it works really well with a task that you just need to get done and probably get done fairly quickly. It's really defined by clearly articulating what it is you need done. And it's focused on a very specific task or transaction. The communication is crystal clear and it really concentrates on what needs to be done by whom, by when and how. The person delegating the task knows exactly what the other person needs to do. So I guess what might be the advantages of using this approach? One thing is it does, it's quick. So um, it doesn't take a lot of time to brief someone in this way. It's very clear and it's a very good way to transfer knowledge if you're doing it from an expert to a novice. So for instance, it's really useful if you've got a new team member who perhaps hasn't got a lot of experience in whatever you're asking them to do. Um, you know, perfect that you can actually give them quite precise instructions of what you want them to do. What it does do is it keeps the control with you as the delegator. Um, as you're prescribing exactly what the other person needs to do, you've got a much larger accountability as a result. And it potentially could reduce risk because if instructions are followed to the letter and your instructions are correct, then actually there's probably not much risk of it going wrong. However, as with that sat nav analogy, there's likely to be very little long term learning there, not particularly motivating or energizing, I would say. So as we begin to move along this continuum, what might a middle ground look like? Because it's not always the case that we want to be one extreme or the other. So we wanted to get you to think about how can you begin to move along this continuum? So when we start to move towards relational delegation, I guess it's about 
dialing up some of the degrees of support we can give or dialing down, I should say, and being able to sort of communicate what needs to be achieved, but not necessarily prescribe the how. It might be that in the middle, what we're doing is seeking some suggestions from the other person to begin to get them engaged in the task and how they might go about dealing with that challenge. And then make a decision together on what's going to be done and how. So in this approach, I'd say there's a lot more focus on the other person's strengths, their motivations, their skill set. Um, and it equips them with those skills and insights they need to complete the task. But it also gives them the space to do this in a way that feels comfortable for them. So I think this can be a really nice middle ground where we enable someone to come in and use their view. So I've used this quite recently with a manager who's never um, recruited anyone and but is clearly very capable. So I've made suggestions to her. We've talked about the approach she'll take with first and second interviews, um, but I've not told her what I think should happen. Um, I've influenced some of those decisions, but I've left it up to her largely to run with it and to lead on it um, because I've got confidence that actually um, she will be able to do that and the person will be reporting to her as well. So then we flip over to relational delegation. And in full relational delegation, we communicate what needs to be achieved, but we allow the other person to decide the how. Your team member is in charge of day-to-day -day decisions and execution of their plan. Your role is really supporting when they prompt you and sort of keeping a bird's eye view. And this is interesting because I think this is challenging when we're remote because the bird's eye view, what does that look like? If you haven't got regular catch ups with them, what other tools or mechanisms do you have to keep that bird's eye view? Do you, for instance, um, post things through a collaboration tool like through Google Docs or through Teams in groups? Like do you have a channel? Can you see updates appearing and you can just kind of keep an eye on it? Or are you simply reliant on receiving an email or having a phone call with that person? To make it work, it's really important that you keep the lines of communication open in both directions. And there's a much greater focus here on the other person's strengths and aspirations. So I know for myself, some of the people I work with are very experienced at what they do and do it much better than me. Um, so I'd say I use this style of delegation frequently with them. So if we're asked to design a new piece of leadership development work, our design lead um, has worked in this field for well over 20 years. She has a master's in instructional design. So providing I give her a clear brief of the expectations of the client, she's very comfortable with ensuring that her team deliver on that piece of work. Where we may check in with each other is if there's maybe a difficult conversation with another team who needs to input. Um, that she thinks maybe I need to be aware of, but often she would lead on that. Or perhaps a tricky conversation with our commercial team who may not have budgeted enough time for a piece of work um, on what, you know, this person's team is being expected to do. So I know where I've got confidence in the person in my team, it's much easier to dial into that relational delegation and um, enjoy giving them the autonomy um, to conduct a task in a way that they feel comfortable. So where would you typically position yourself on this scale? And you know, what are the advantages, I guess, of this relational approach? The person completing the task can show their initiative. So they've got freedom to decide how they want to complete it. And the focus as the delegator is on engaging the other person rather than instructing them. So if you are one of those people who's a catalyst, gets things going in life, this is probably going to be something you really enjoy doing because you generate enthusiasm. And actually, a lot of people will put more discretionary effort in to a task that's delegated in this way because they feel more excited and more engaged in how they're going to complete it. It feels a lot more kind of rewarding to them, I guess. It also builds a stronger relationship between yourself and the other person because the other person feels appreciated and valued 
And as we saw from the research at the start, this is especially important in this sort of digital hybrid world. And actually, shock horror, you might get a better solution than anticipated. So if we think back to self-enhancement bias, which I talked about at the beginning, and the different creative houses that resulted in me giving you a much looser brief, where people have a level of experience and skill, we need to watch out for thinking we'd be better than others at the task and instead give people a chance to have a go. Accepting and you know, encouraging that they would do it a different way, but still get a useful, maybe an even better or more creative result by allowing them to approach it their way. It's important to have a little patience um, as well, I think, because when we're delegating to another person and they're trying to find their way, so maybe we're in the middle or maybe we're using relational, Remember the sort of torch versus the sat nav analogy. If you're using a more relational style, they might take a few wrong turns um, or they may need a few attempts to find the best route to the goal or the desired output. So these, I guess, overall are kind of the building blocks of delegation. And you might have heard of this before, but thinking back to those mindsets at the beginning of the session that, that very easily block us, it's easy to slip into the, it'll be quicker to do it myself, especially when we're working remotely. So, you know, really keep this continuum in mind. Um, I'd say almost daily for most of us. So now we've reminded ourselves of the different options we have on how to delegate. Let's think about what we should be delegating. So, the key thing to consider is what we can delegate, what's appropriate that we can delegate to free up our time, to enable us to have more space for those strategic um, activities. So typically, the things that broadly most of us could think about delegating are tactical tasks. So the doing at the coal face, you know, watch out for holding on to those as you progress. And some of the challenge there is some of those things we quite like doing. They're things that kind of are quite satisfying. I think often they fall into being a little bit reactive as well. And there is something satisfying about kind of ticking them off your list and getting them done, uh, especially if you're someone who quite likes um, action. The, the harder, non-urgent, strategic, important stuff that you need to sit back and think about sometimes can feel more painful and much harder to do. So I think sometimes we're kind of attracted to these little tasks. Secondly, begin to think about projects and opportunities that would help your team members develop themselves in a particular direction. So in the career conversations you're having, begin to take note of the things that people want to do that will help them develop in a particular direction. Because actually, if you can make a match there, that can be really um, work really well for both of you because you're giving that per person the, the growth and opportunity that they're looking for, but you're also helping with your workload and what your team overall are trying to deliver. Thirdly, probably my favorite one, tasks that aren't your area of strength and someone in your team has that strength. So uh, we've got EG detail there. So. Perhaps you don't like being in the minutiae um, and looking at the detail of things. Perhaps you prefer that bigger picture. So, you know, think about who's got that strength and give them the opportunity to use that. So maybe there's some proofreading that needs to be done. Get the person with that strength of detail to really, uh, you know, dial that up and use it around those tasks. And then finally, I would say tasks that stop you from achieving your goals. You know, is there a way to delegate those to a different team? You know, and and I guess thinking about if they are blockers for your team overall, who else in the organisation should be working on them? Do they align with the overall objectives that your project has got? And if they don't, why are they sitting with you? So something worth doing is to have a look at your to do list and think about what could be delegated. Um, we will make some suggestions of some missions at the end, but I think really think about those tactical, 
kind of attractive tasks, the projects that would help someone develop in a particular area, things that you shouldn't really own that you could get rid of, and tasks that aren't your area of strength where your team perhaps can do a better job. Now what we need to do is think about who would be the best person to delegate to and to engage and support them, I guess. How, how are we going to engage and support them? So I guess we get, need to get really clear in our own minds on the task, the scope, uh, the purpose and the output and deadlines that are required. And then we need to consider the skills, the strengths, the time required to complete the task. And then I guess it's who is the best fit given the timing and also given your team's aspirations and goals. So I know I had someone in my team who wanted to do a lot more writing and, um, and we were asked to provide more marketing content. And so it was great to be able to give her a window where she could actually begin to practice her writing skills and um, have the opportunity to research some of those activities um, and, and support with that kind of, it was almost kind of like an extracurricular activity for us, but something that was really important in terms of our market presence. I think it might be worth keeping a chart or a record of all your team members' development goals, you know, when you have those career conversations and maybe also their top strengths, because really thinking about where you see them perform at their best and where they're most energized can really help you when it comes to delegating. So once you're clear on who, then you need to think through, first of all, what's the best way of engaging them? And what support do they need and how will I check in? And with some people to engage them, perhaps they're quite reflective in style. So actually what they might appreciate is you noting down some of the things that are needed in written form that they can reflect on before having a conversation. Other people will be really engaged by, um, you know, an, a kind of energizing uh, verbal brief. So it's knowing what their preferences are and when you see them at their best. And then thinking about what support you need to provide ongoing, because actually some people may just want you to get out of their way and other people may want to know the regular milestones or check in points with yourself, particularly important if you are virtual. So I guess there's a number of factors that you need to think about. First of all, making sure you share the bigger picture. So the why of the project. So why you've picked them for the task, why as a team, this particular task is important and linking that to their values, strengths, skills, aspirations, development goals. Think about the right style of delegation. Do you need to be very precise and task focused or can you use a more relational style that's more motivating and supportive? Or is there something in between? Also be really clear with them what authority and resources they will have so they know what the boundaries are. They know exactly what they're accountable for and not. And then also any milestones that wider stakeholders might be anticipating, um, any sort of project updates that are required. I guess in our hybrid working world, more and more of these delegation conversations might happen virtually. Um, and we've got less social cues available to know whether the other person has understood and how engaged they feel. Yes, we can see them on video, um, but you don't see all the other kind of um, reference points uh, around that conversation or how they are perhaps later in the day to know how it's landed. So think about whether maybe you could do the initial brief in person or if it's virtually, you know, make sure you are using your webcam and make sure you're turning off other notifications. I mean, we've all been there, haven't we, on a call with someone who's clearly not looking at us on the camera, but they're looking at their email or their teams or something else that's distracting them. And actually, it's amazing how much people appreciate their manager or leader just being fully present, even if it is just for 10 minutes. And ideally, I think with the support, if you can mutually agree what's helpful to them and what you need as well. And I think being honest yourself about what you need is really important and sort of setting expectations of 
when you want to check in, as well as asking them what works for them is key. I just wanted to remind you of maybe what might be obvious now, but I think it's really important that we keep in mind that the things we see in person are not as visible virtually. So for effective digital delegation, we need to consider how to both brief the delegation and check in effectively virtually. And as you can see from the image on the slide, in a hybrid or remote world, the things we usually see when we're in person are no, no longer visible. And I don't know, this might look like a typical environment in one of your institutions, uh, working on a kind of project funded by NIHR, or it may not look anything like it. I'm not sure many of us sit around a big dinner table, do we? But this is probably like a shared office space, I suppose. But you can get the idea here. You know, Don's got his head down, seems really focused. Rena's been away from her desk for a while. Chris looks stressed and distracted. Sasha's drunk a lot of coffee this morning. These are all the things, the cues that we no longer can see. And it's really important to keep this in mind. Even now we are more hybrid and perhaps seeing people again sometimes in person. And in a study it, um, reported by the Harvard Business Review in 2021, 40% of people reported feeling isolated at work. And the result had been lower organizational commitment and engagement. Now that was still at the height of the pandemic, but many of us haven't returned to being fully in person. And so those feelings of isolation or disconnection are lingering for some people. So with delegation in a digital world, what might you miss? What do you need to look out for and notice? Just have a think about that. It's really important to notice if someone has more capacity or perhaps wants to be stretched further. And it's important to notice that as much as it's important to notice someone who is maybe overwhelmed by a task or a challenge that has been delegated to them, maybe feels like they've just got too much on. Noticing is critical as a leader and we have to work harder at it when we're doing it virtually. One tool that can help us be really clear when our team member should ask for support, especially if we can't see how they're getting on, is something that we've borrowed from Gore-Tex, and that's called Agree Your Waterline. It's a guiding principle they use. So any decisions that would cause serious damage, they say to their enterprise, and we can translate that as to our project, um, all those decisions, your team member should consult you first. They sit below the waterline. Above the waterline, the team member can, you know, feel free to make those calls themselves. And that means decisions above the waterline can be made much more faster and with more agility. This is really important with relational delegation. So be clear where that line of autonomy is when it comes to making decisions within the task that you've delegated. And in in think about in what situations they need a check-in with you before making a call or a decision and you might have to define that with them so maybe it's where they've got to spend money or perhaps it's an irreversible decision or perhaps it's a decision that affects a large number of people so we're coming to the end i'm looking forward to seeing your questions that you've posted um but a, first of all a suggestion of six personal missions um, and I suggest you choose one or two to experiment with after the webinar um, to put your learning into practice. So firstly think about how you spend your time and where you could be freed up and um, this is always tricky um, it's like stepping back and almost analysing your calendar and I found as I have developed as a leader you know, at different stages, I need different touch points with different team members. And it can be hard because it maybe means reducing some of my one to ones with people who are no longer direct reports and dialing up the time I spend perhaps with my leadership team. Or perhaps I'm getting involved in very tactical activities because I quite like them. So it's kind of being honest with ourselves about where we spend our time and where we could free ourselves up. Keeping a chart with your team members' development goals and workload. Using these webinar materials to create your own draft delegation process that you could refer to each time you need to delegate something. 
asking for feedback after you've delegated a task and it's been completed, that can be really helpful because often we don't know how it's landed. Experiment with delegating tasks that aren't your areas of strength. They feel like winners to me. Um, and reflect on your own experiences and assumptions of micromanagement. And, you know, I, I would imagine most of us have probably experienced a micromanager at some stage in our career, and it's really uncomfortable. So think about what will be empowering for each team member and think about how you can avoid falling into that trap by setting things up the right way from the beginning. For the most likely chance of success, it's best, I guess, to take a test and learn approach where you try out one of these missions and then tweak them to fit your context or try a different one if that didn't really work for you. I know leaders within the NIHR like a little bit of further reading. So we've put together some um, uh, sources for you. Um, some of the research that I referred to at the beginning is at the top there in terms of things that you could go away and read. There's a couple of great podcasts. Um, the Delegating Effectively one by HBR is lovely. And the um, one of the uh, guests talks about the language that we use when we're delegating and how, how direct we should be. Because she talks about, one of the um, guests talks about how if we say, look, what we're going to do can seem a little bit um, not direct enough, you know? And um, actually we maybe need to say, what you're going to do is, so it's quite an interesting debate they have on that. There's another one there with a the seven step process. And then I really recommend Dan Pink and Drive. Um, it's something close to my heart, I have to be honest, because I, um, for my master's, uh, looked at self-determination theory, which his, his model is based on. And it talks about how important autonomy is in terms of motivation. And that's a really nice um, illustrated uh, video um, which highlights the importance of autonomy and how much it fuels people's growth. So I do recommend that. I don't think it's particularly long from recollection. I think it might be seven or eight minutes long. Um, and it's a lovely introduction to that model. I'd like to thank you for your time today. And I'm gonna hand back to Sarah who is going to facilitate our Q&A. Thanks, Steph. Yes, we do have a few questions. So I'm just going to get those up now. Sure. Um, so first of all, if anybody's got any more questions they want to add in, just pop them in and you can also upvote the ones that you particularly want to see answered by clicking the thumb icon. Uh, okay, so the most upwater question we currently have is, are some people just better at delegating than others? <laughs> I think it's definitely a skill that can be learnt. Um, and I do think we have preferences in terms of our default style, you know, whether we're more comfortable with that uh, precise task focused style or whether we're more comfortable with relational. Um, and, you know, it takes time and practice to refine it. Um, and I guess, you know, needs to be driven by the right mindset, which we talked about at the beginning. So I think it's definitely something we can all improve on, even if some people instinctively find it easier than others. Um, it's an area of tension in my house because my husband likes the precise style, especially with workmen who come in. He likes to be clear on exactly what they're going to do. I'm more like you're fixing my door, crack on. I have no knowledge of how to fix the door. So, you know, I do think some of us, and, and I think that the sort of situation will impact instinctively um, the style that we'll want to use. But I would encourage you that everybody can improve at delegation. Thank you, Steph. Okay, so the next question with the most upvotes, what if you start with, relational delegation where it doesn't seem to be going well should you switch to precise task delegation yeah I mean I think what I would say is rather than go black white like either end of the spectrum move a bit further along the continuum so if you notice that someone's struggling and they're not really getting something off the ground or perhaps they're not figuring out the best way you need to up your support you need to start having more conversations so you don't want to take their autonomy totally away and say, you've not done this, do this. 
what you want to do is find a way to coach them. And really, that's asking some good questions and then asking them if they'd like a few suggestions to throw into how they're approaching it as well. So I think what you want to avoid is jumping to the other extreme, because then that could be quite demotivating. Lovely, thank you. This next question is related to the last question, so I'll move straight on. What if I have used relational delegation and let someone get on with something, but then I'm really not happy with the outcome and only realise this at the end? Yeah, that's uncomfortable, isn't it? <laughs> um, and there's learning for us, I think, as a leader, because did we check in enough through the life of the task or did we just delegate it and kind of drop it, you know, because we've got a responsibility there, I think, if we haven't kept an eye on it. Um, and I think also it's worth considering. Are, like, have they just approached it in a different way to us? So it's not necessarily wrong, but they've done it their way. Um, and what's the actual outcome? And does it meet that original goal? Um, and, you know, sometimes that's a bit uncomfortable because, again, we're quite tied to wanting it done the way we've always done it. Um, but I suspect if you've ended up without the outcome you needed, it's probably a bit of a tricky, candid conversation. And my biggest advice there is just to focus on the impact rather than directly kind of criticizing the person and also talk about what extra support that could be put in place next time, maybe some more frequent check ins, because if you've got more frequent check ins as the delegator, you're hopefully able to pick up that something isn't going the way you want it to go. Lovely, thank you. OK, our next question. What if you have a task to delegate? That doesn't particularly fit with the strengths or aspirations of any of your team members. Yeah, that's a tricky one, isn't it? Because that does occasionally happen. And um, I think it's really important to be able to communicate the why, you know, that the purpose and how that links to the wider goals of the team. So, you know, it might not fit in with people's top strengths that they love using every day, but you know, you can coach them to think about how they could still bring their strengths to bear to support them in this task. So, um, you know, maybe um, if it's it requires a lot of detail, you know, the detailed spreadsheet tasks that I referred to earlier, they're on my mind, aren't they, at the moment? Um, and the person isn't maybe fired up by detail work. Maybe they've got a strength of curiosity, you know, being curious about the best way to actually leverage that data from the spreadsheet and to kind of present their results in a really kind of user friendly way. So it's really trying to find a way that will enable someone to use their unique strengths that I think will help. Lovely, thank you, Steph. Okay, it's just conscious of time. We've got five minutes left and a couple more questions. Okay. What if I have to delegate something and I don't really believe in it or see the purpose of it myself? Yeah, and I think this is hard and I, I People have asked me this when we've talked about influence as well. You know, what if I don't really believe in it myself? And, you know, we are sort of, you know, citizens of our organisation to a certain degree as leaders and managers. I think it's really important to go back to, if possible, the originator of the why this project or task is important, because that might help you communicate it better and to reflect on why it might help with other strategic goals and then you can share that with your team member, because I do think I mean, I believe very much in authenticity. I think it would be really hard to inspire people to do their best work if you really didn't believe in why we were doing the task. Well answered. Thank you. Um, next question. Is there a recommended best practice of how often we should check in when the delegated task is being carried out virtually? I don't think there is. I think, and, and uh, you know, it's um, it depends on the individual, depends on your working relationship with them. I think it depends on their experience, how motivated you perceive, or perhaps they share with you they are, how complex the task is, and any deadlines or other stakeholders involved. So I think with most things, it's worth experimenting. You know, it might just be that you need a brief milestone once a week. Or it might be that you need to check in more frequently. Maybe if you've kind of got a sprint over a two or three week period to deliver something, actually leaving it a week is too long. 
The other thing is, I think it's really, remember the waterline, the Gore-Tex um, principle, really good to think about the things that they can make decisions on themselves and the things that they need to come to you about, because then you can make sure that outside of check-ins, they know how to access you if there are decisions kind of below the waterline that need to be made. Absolutely. Okay, so we've got a couple left. I'll try and get them all in. If we don't manage to answer all of your questions today, we will uh, we'll, we'll answer them virtually and then send them out. Um, I find when I delegate, I sometimes have to spend ages getting it to the standard required, especially if it is for audience outside of the team to prevent reputational damage. So then I guess they're looking for a... Um... I guess they're sharing that as a challenge, aren't they? And I think yeah. it's, very valid. it's a very valid challenge. And I think that comes back to us and the way we coach others in terms of what that end piece of work looks like, but also challenging ourselves. Um, when you use the words reputational damage, I think you probably are really concerned about the quality of it. But sometimes I know with myself, I want it my way and I get a bit stuck in my way. And maybe if I step back, their way is just as good. So I think it's knowing where that line is drawn. So, um, yeah, I hear you. Challenging. Absolutely. Um, Sally, I'm just going to answer your question directly here. Uh, Sally's put coaching is such a useful tool for managers. Does the NIHR offer any? So, Sally, I would say if you watch this space we've got lots of different opportunities coming up over the next year um, and if you do want any more specific information email us directly um, our email address is on the evaluation form and the slides that can be sent out email us directly we can give you dates and times of anything that might be useful for you or your colleagues um, and then finally we've got one question left on one minute Steph so we'll try and get this in how do you feel about different delegation styles with the same employee one style for one type of task, the other style for another type of task. Could it be confusing? No, I think that's great. I think that's the real world because if you're delegating something they've done loads of times before, you're not going to need to use precise, you know, um, uh, kind of very specific instructions. But actually, if it's something um, that they've never done before, they probably do need a much more detailed brief. So I think that's completely appropriate. What's important is to contract with them and have that upfront conversation with them so that it's explicit what you're doing. Um, and I think they will see the reason for that. So, yeah, I think that's the real world. And I welcome that. Lovely. Thank you, Steph. Right on time. It's exactly two o'clock. So thank you again, Steph, for delivering this excellent session. We really hope that everyone's found this webinar beneficial and that you feel able to implement some of these behaviours that we've explored today. As I mentioned at the start of the webinar, for those of you that are joining us live, as we close the session, you will be asked to complete a quick evaluation form. Uh, the link is also in the chat if you want to save it for later. And this gives you an opportunity to share your email address so you can receive a copy of the slides. And if you have time, please do provide us with your feedback. All of our past webinars can be found on our NIHR TV YouTube channel under the Development and Support Webinars playlist. And this one will also be added to that same playlist. So once again, thank you all for your time and enjoy the rest of your day.